Welcome. My presentation today is going to be on, uh, I call it bridging electronics to wireless infrastructure. What this is, is a little bit about a new uh, category of tags that we have. Um, and these tags are not only uh, RF coupled, but they also have provisions for connection via uh, US, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, an, an I squared C connection. So it's an NFC tag with an RF front end and also an I squared C. So this is a, a brand new area in, in, in the uh, industry that's really catching on. Lots of folks are finding applications for this. So I want to share that with you today. If we have time, I'm going to go rather quickly because there's a lot of information to share. But if we have time, I'll also share another category uh, with you, it's called our U code I squared C. And that U code I squared C is similar, but it's UHF. So you get longer read range instead of the short read range with an NFC type of device. My name is Victor Vega, and um, I'm uh, basically uh, responsible, for, responsible for RFID and NFC solutions at NXP. Okay, with that, what we'll do is we'll start off with a uh, little bit of an intro and level setting, very basic. And then we'll talk about these connected tags and then move on to our portfolio for supporting each of these different things that we're talking about, as well as give you some demos in between the, uh, the discussion, okay? So uh, NXP, if, if you are not aware of our portfolio, supports all versions of, and protocols, I should say, and frequencies of RFID and NFC. So we have LF, low frequency, high frequency, which is 13.56, same as NFC. Of course, we, we support uh, NFC as well, and then UHF. And that's in a host of different types of applications. What is it? Basically, if you think about both RFID or NFC, what it is is think of it as a wireless USB stick. So you have a double EEPROM memory, and you're able to read and write to that memory, but you do that wirelessly. That's pretty neat. But in addition, you have a connection that you can make to your uh, devices, and we'll talk more about that later on. And by the way, in, in this uh, diagram here, we show that with LF, HF, and UHF, they all have magnetic coupling. So those are near-field couplers. They have a loop, typically. UHF is the only one that really allows you the flexibility to put a dipole. Now you can get really long read range. I mean, many tens of feet, right? But the simplicity as you go up in frequency is, is such that you have fewer turns because your inductance goes down as the frequency goes up. So we're, we're only going to focus on near field, which is uh, HF, essentially, and UHF. So if you had an RFID system, what you would, uh, the components that you would have are basically the tag. And then you would have a conventional reader and a conventional antenna. And these components here are typically you know, upwards to $1,000, maybe a little bit more, up to $3,000. So they're not something that you or I have in, in our homes. Well, I do, but most people probably don't. So the advantage of having NFC is that most of us do have NFC reader writers with us if you have an NFC-enabled telephone. So again, these are the components that you would expect to see with UHF. What we're going to do is focus mostly on NFC. So um, the elements that you need there are an NFC-enabled mobile phone and then the tag. Okay? In the uh, mobile phone arena, NXP has been a big player there for many, many years. So our reader writers are also inside of these phones. Okay? We're a major provider of those. So what we do is we basically just energize the field by virtue of having the tag in proximity to the reader writer, and then it derives its energy from that, it self uh, powers, and then it extracts the clock it needs and exchanges the data that it's been asked to provide. In the phone, you pretty much have three different things that uh, a reader writer can do for NFC compatibility. And the one is it can act as a reader and a writer, so you can read and write to the tags. The other thing that the phone can do is it can emulate a tag. So if you're going to a, a point of sale and you see a terminal to pay for a product, if you have a contactless card, you can present the contactless card. But if you have this in emulation mode, you can use your phone as an emulated tag. So you don't need the physical tag. And you have one more means of communication, and that's called peer-to-peer. Peer-to-peer means that I could have for example, two phones, and I could talk to them. You guys have seen the Samsung commercials where they do bumping and things of that nature. So what we're doing there is we basically have a field. As you look here, we have a field that turns on when the tag is in proximity to the device, right? You can see the little blipping. 
when that light is illuminated, that's transmitting. When it's not, then it's letting somebody else talk, for example. Okay, so enough about the phone itself. Let's jump into the frequencies and try to denote the difference between NFC and UHF. The main difference between the two is the read range. That's the obvious one. So with NFC, you're going to have a very short read range up to about usually a couple inches with the phone. Um, with UHF, you know, I've seen as far as about 150 feet, but that's a, under pristine conditions. It's not normal. Usually you have like 20 feet or something like that. Still, it's a lot. So as far as UHF is concerned, it clearly has the advantage as far as re read distance. The disadvantage is most people don't have a phone to read and write. So the, the consumer infrastructure reach is very broad today with the uh, proliferation of, of the mobile phones. So that's why this is so interesting. Um, here's a little video that, uh, that we have. And it's basically just showing all the different devices, not all of them, but it's showing a snapshot of all the different devices out there. And I won't waste your time on the, on the uh, video here too much, but what this is showing is how people, for example, here in San Francisco are using NFC to tap on a tag and extract some more information so the consumer can be tied in closer to the product of interest. And then as we have seen in the past, you can take these and you can bump you can bump them with somebody else's and exchange information. But you can imagine how you could use this for extracting information like nutritional value or is it, di is it dietary need, what it is that you need um, before you purchase it. There, they're just doing some bumping. Um, further down, you'll see that they're doing some uh, things. For example, this guy's got a phone that's NFC enabled so he can download music. Unfortunately, that phone doesn't. But um, you can see that uh, this allows somebody to tie in with their customer database. That's all neat. But how can I take it to the next level? One of the cool things that you can do with this is that you could take the technology and use it in something as simple as, let's say, a speaker. So for example, Samsung uses our tag in here. It's called our NTAG. Um, this is the older generation, NTAG 203F. And the F stands for uh, field detect. And I'll show you an example of how you can use that. That's the first in the connected series of tags. So we just talked about some tags. Now we're going to talk about the connected tags. So if you look at devices that may need Bluetooth pairing or Wi-Fi pairing, things of that nature, speakers like I just showed you there, headphones, uh, even earpieces, um, it's really easy to connect with them if you have one of these two devices, either the 213F or the 216F. These are the newer model of what was in there. There's a lot of features here. These are just the tags, but those two with the asterisk have the field detect. And we'll talk a little about those in just a second. Suffice it to say that there's a lot of features here that I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with you guys unless you want to later. But they have uh, such things as a UID, a unique identification that gives you identification of each device. So it's, it's got its own signature, if you will. And then it has what we call an originality signature for validation that the product is authentic. So it uses um, the UID plus a, a private key, and then we do ECC uh, encryption and put the key inside of this tag. And uh, it also has a counter, which is interesting. If you have a, a disposable product, each time you turn that on or tap, it could count. And it tells you how many times that thing has been tapped or turned on. And then that information can be mirrored and sent out to the cloud or to your embedded system. That's pretty neat. So let's jump into the 216 and the 213F, because these have the field detect. This has the um, thing that we were just talking about, the originality signature, which is for that family. What it is is in the, in the field, um, you would fetch the public key. Remember, we had already used ECC, ellipt elliptic curve cryptography, and the UID plus a private key. You grab the public key, and then when you grab that public key, you ask for the UID, the unique identification. Every single one of these tags is unique. And then I uh, read the signature, that signature that was deployed in, in the factory. And if that is validated, then you know that this is an authentic product. Otherwise, you can move on and assume it's been breached. Now let's talk about the, the field detect. When you bring this in proximity to the tag, what you'll see is that this line gets pulled low, asserted low. When that line gets asserted low, then what we could do is tell a power management unit or a micro Bluetooth controller, whatever we want, to activate and turn it on. So the device could be in a deep sleep mode until it sees the field. That's pretty neat. I'll give you that demo in just one second. 
Schematically, this is what you've got. You've got your coil on this side, you've got non-volatile memory, and then basically just a field detect pin on that side, which is connected to your device. So let's show you this. Here you'll see the Samsung um, uh, speaker, and on the side here is a bar that would show, typically it would be illuminated if you have power or Bluetooth connectivity. In this case, we don't because nothing is powered on. It's in deep sleep. So I dare try this with a brand new phone, but I hope I have music. Um, Yes, I do. Okay, so I, let's say for example, I wanted to give this to my mom. My mom would not care to do any Bluetooth pairing, but if I told her just tap, and it's that, that simple, she can handle that. So I take this, and when I tap on this, notice that the, the uh, power indicator comes up, right there, and that's the power indicator, and that's the Bluetooth connectivity. Now, if I wanted to play my music, I can control it completely from here. I can control volume, here's the master, by the way, and then I can control the volume from here and lower it or raise it. Um, and if I wanted to, I could turn on and off the music. By tapping this again, I can turn it off. I just power down the Bluetooth connectivity. So that makes it really simple. You tap, it does the pairing, and as you saw, it turned it on as well. That's pretty neat. The next thing that we're gonna do is start talking about how you would use this for uh, um, headsets and other devices just makes life a lot easier instead of going through the pairing process that you normally would go through which is very cumbersome you just tap okay where else could you use this well you could use this on uh, for example printers um, much of the time when you have to print a boarding document for uh, an airplane uh, ticket uh, typically what you'll do is if you're like me you, you will send that to your email address and then print it at, from there. So what they're now talk, talking about doing is taking your mobile phone, you tap on this device, it doesn't exchange uh, as far as the Bluetooth credentials or Wi-Fi, and then with the higher um, baud rate, then it, it'll send that information to that printer if it authenticates you. So you, if you're in a corporate environment, then that could say, yes, you, you have permissions to print or not. You want to talk to electronics, now you have a mechanism to do so. Okay, and you can do so very cheaply. Now, we sell the entire portfolio from tags all the way to the readers, right? All the, the chips that are like in the phones. And sometimes the reader chip just isn't cost effective. You have a mass market product and it's very cost sensitive, or you want to compete and keep the cost really low but have all the features that something else um, at a higher price point might have. And that's where this device comes in really handy. So, for example, you can have a remote GUI, a remote user interface, and keep the, uh, the display cost down, or even the Wi-Fi or Bluetooth cost down, because you don't have to deploy that. You can do your connection via the NFC tapping. So for example, if you have a wearable device, this year you know, wearables are, are pretty popular. If I have a very limited display space there, I can tap with this and extract a lot of information out of that, keep the cost low, and get a feature-rich application. I'll show you that in a minute. So what are we doing here? Fundamentally, it's the same as RFID, except for here we're using the phone, NFC. We give that the power and the commands, and then it responds with, it, with its data wirelessly. But what we have is the I2C connectivity, and now I can talk directly from here, use this as a modem, and talk to this guy. I can read and write to that guy. Con conversely, I can talk from this guy, pass through here, and talk to this guy. So it's bi-directional communication, and I didn't have to add a lot, a lot of electronics. Some folks, when they start talking about embedded systems where you need a transmitter inside of your, your device, be it a reader for UHF or a reader for NFC, you get a little nervous because now they have to deal with compliance. This is a passive tag. There's no FCC regulation or anything that you need for that. It's very simple. So that means your entry to the market's fast. That's nice. All right, so let's see what we can do with this relatively inexpensive uh, tag, connected tag. First of all, the N tag I squared C is comprised of a couple of things. One, you have not only the double EEPROM memory, the non-volatile memory, but we also have SRAM. And the, the reason for the SRAM is so you can use that for a buffer. We all know that double EEPROM memory has a limited life, right? So many cycles you can write to it. Maybe it's 100,000 or whatever, but it's still limited. But with the SRAM, that's basically memory that I can write to over and over and over and not have to worry about depleting my cycles, my life cycles on, on the memory of the double EEPROM memory. Here, I have my field detect. So when I bring the tag in proximity to the mobile phone, the field detect would assert low. 
that would in turn tell the power management unit, wake up, just like you saw with the speaker. But what's really cool is that I could also rectify this energy and I could send that out, my V, v out, which is power harvested energy. Now this can power everything else. It can power my micro, it can power my PMU, it can power even an LED. I'll show you a demo of that in just a second. So now this turns on the power to the other stuff, the other micro, and then now I can communicate back and forth. That's pretty neat. So let's just show you here how we do that with um, a demo board. I have a demo board here that has um, basically just an antenna. So on this side it's the antenna and, and the NTAG, I squared C. And now I'm going to plug that into this board. And this board has, as you can see, a bunch of circuitry. It's got a microprocessor. We're using the LPC 812. Um, and then it has a temperature sensor. So you can, attach, you can attach other things to this as well. And I have my analog to digital converter. And then I'll convert that over and see what it is. I've got some input switches. And I have some output LEDs. So there's a lot of little tricks on, on this, um, a lot of components on this. And notice there is no battery. So what we're going to do here is we're going to try to turn on my phone. OK, and now when I um, activate this app, what I'll do is ask you, sir, pick a color. And don't tell me what it is, but push the, the button on the color of your choice, all right? And I'll tell you what color you chose. All right, this gentleman chose blue. Everybody picks blue. They love blue, right? <laughs> you can't tell you how many people do blue. So, what I did is I basically took the phone, and then I bring that in proximity to this guy, and you can see I'm powering up all that circuitry. That's kind of cool. That's the LED, and LEDs are not exactly efficient, and the micro, and the temperature sensor. So if you look at this side, what you'll see is the temperature. Read the temperature for me. That's right. So it's giving you the actual temperature, because there's a temperature sensor on this. Now let's do one more thing. Let's show you the bi-directional communication. I've just shown you how I'm reading from this, um, as far as the temperature, back to this. And then I showed you how I read from this to that direction on the color. So now let's push button number two. And then I'll present this and tell me which button illuminates. On the bottom, number two. That's right. So you can see that I've basically had a sensor that could send the information this direction, both temperature and the, the status of the switch or the configuration, and I could send it the other way. Now that's pretty neat. Well, it doesn't end there. It gets even more exciting. But those are the fundamental building blocks for the NTAG I squared C. And again, we're using the LPC 812 on this, which is very efficient. OK, the next thing we'll do is share some use cases with you and then jump into some demos. So we already talked about how folks are using this for, as you've seen, mobile phones, but tablets, computers, um, printers, speakers, headphones. There's just a huge array of products. Now with the NTAG I squared C, it's allowed us to jump into other markets that are even more exciting. For example, could be white goods, home appliances, could be your temperature uh, thermostat, sensors. Here's a great one. Here in the state of California, we get our share of earthquakes. What if I had this? on the back of a sheetrock wall. And this has a sensor instead of temperature, but it's got a sensor that's connected to the beam. And it's a stress indicator to see if there's been any damage for the year, right? And maybe once a year they go by, or after a quake, they go by and they check it. I don't want to have to tear up the wall to check that sensor. And I certainly don't want to put a battery back there, because then I'll have to replace it every now and then. But you can imagine that if I had my sticker, and I basically just once a year I come up to that and I, I tap on it, I can turn on the, the micro and extract the sensor information. That's pretty neat. OK, so moving on. If you look at some of the things that I'm going to show you, we're going to talk about white goods and a thermostat. Now, why on earth did we choose those? Generally speaking, these are dumb devices. So how, how many people have a washing machine that has Wi-Fi and, and a touch screen? They make them, but most of us don't have those. We typically buy the ones on the lower end of the spectrum that are very simple. It's got your temperature, it's got your load size, and things of that nature. But basically, it's just a toggle button that lets you go through hot, medium, and, and cold, or something of that nature. However, these guys have to compete with upper end models, right? It'd be nice if they could compete with that with almost no added cost, but still get all the features that you could with the upper end, right? A thermostat. 
how many of you have seen, I'm, I'm sure several of you have them, the, the next, uh, Nest uh, thermostat? Those are really cool, but a lot of people are refraining from spending you know, $250, $300 on a thermostat. Let's see what we can do with a $20 thermostat to give you basically those same features and functions. Not all of them, but a lot of them. So, zero power configuration. The advantage here, some people ask, why would I do that instead of using BLE, for example? Well, with BLE, you need power. And BLE also is a transmitter, so it's always going to be sending out information. Just think about that. If you had a band personal device on, on your, your wrist, and let's say that it's using a hearing aid battery, perhaps like a 1.8 volt battery, you don't have very much power. So can you afford to be broadcasting all day long and still conserve enough energy? Well, maybe, maybe not. But with NFC, it's by intent. Perhaps you have a pedometer. And at the end of the day, you want to see your status. Well, I don't need that every second. At the end of the day, I tap on it, and I extract that information. I look at my settings to see what my goals were, and I see how I progressed in comparison to my, my settings. Well, that's sufficient for me. And guess what? I cut the cost down quite a bit. But you can also configure it, um, and that's really interesting. Extended product features, I'll show you that by virtue of the demo instead of speaking to it. And then enhanced user experience, I'll show you that as well. And convenient activation and pairing, I showed you that already. So let's go through this. These are some of the everyday life examples of how you could use NFC for um, making life a little easier for you. Well, we talked about the wearables. Uh, gateways, folks are using this such that when they tap on the gateway, for example, they extract the information, the, the Wi-Fi credentials. Um, today, if you have to connect devices to your Wi-Fi system, you gotta, especially if you're using the predetermined key, it's kind of cumbersome and clunky. And there's a, Usually the passwords I can't remember. So it's kind of nice that I can just tap on that and extract it. Hotspots. You can imagine you can do the same with the hotspot. Say I wanted to share my hotspot with you, then you just tap on it instead of me trying to read it out to you. Printers, we kind of talked about that already. And uh, audio, uh, for example, what we were talking about here. Healthcare and fitness, that makes a lot of sense. So if I had this health band um, and I go to a fitness center, it's kind of neat because at that time I could tap onto the machine and it would, it would basically provide the information to the fitness equipment, who I am, what my settings are, my goals, and then at the end of the exercise it could import the data back in here so that I could retrieve that later on. And that's kind of nice. The other thing is if I wanted to I could do Bluetooth pairing and perhaps have a music selection that's been stored, something of that nature as well. So. I'm going to start off with the washing machine. And, and on the washing machine, like I said before, there's two ends of the spectrum. There's those washing machines that are very pricey with a touch screen and Wi-Fi, and I think they fold your clothes and everything. They're really pretty neat. Well, we can't fold your clothes here, but what we can do is uh, give you a really nice extended user interface. So again, I'm going to uh, start up this uh, app and uh, give you a demonstration. What I'm going to use here is a Nexus 7, which in itself has NFC. It's got our chip in here as well. But I'm not using the NFC of this device. In fact, that's turned off. What I am using, though, is the NTAG I2C. And I've basically just cut this open, and I put a tag, NTAG I2C, inside the case. Um, so now, this is totally passive. Here's my reader writer. This is passive. I tap on the washing machine. And similar to what you see up here, I have wash temperature, load size, soil level, fabric type, and all I can do is toggle amongst those four different settings. So it's a very basic washing machine. I'm going to make it even better. Before I do that, you have to register your washing machine, or you should, or they ask you to. But how many people have ever registered their washing machines? Forget it, right? You have to write down your serial number, your model number, when you bought it, who you are, what your address is. Forget it. So if you did send that in, that has a $2 value to these guys. Well, if that's got a $2 value to these guys for the warranty and the marketing information and nobody's sending it in, they're not making too much money. Let's make that easier. So what I do is I have my phone and I tap on the NFC sticker. And when I tap on that NFC sticker, a couple things happen. I will read the serial number and the model number out of this, out of this machine. Okay, so here I, I tap on it and you can see my sticker goes away and this goes into a state that says it's alert and ready to go. You can see it turned on. Now. I need to fill my information, my address, my name, and all that good stuff, but I can do that very easily because in my system, I have, well, first I extracted the serial number and model number, but in my system, I have my defaults where I can fill my name in because it's got my name. It's got everything in there. I take this, 
and I push submit. And when I push submit, it's sent to the cloud. I'm done. My registration process is done. Now that was painless. I can handle that. Now let's take this and put it in here. What if you ever had a defective washing machine and you had to get service on it? Well, first thing they're going to ask you is what's your model number, your serial number, is it under warranty, where'd you buy it? Heaven knows, right? You don't have all that information available. So let's take this and let's put it in there. It says unregistered right now. So I tap on here and when I do that, it now goes into a ready state. It's registered. All my information is now in the washing machine. That's pretty cool. Now, I also have provisions such that I can have a revenue stream directly to you. If I sell Tide, for example, now when I tap on this thing, on the NFC sticker, it could route you to my website that says, would you like to order a two gallon bottle of, of Tide? Now I have an established connection with you and a, a new revenue source. That's pretty neat as well. So here I tap this and put this inside my wallet. Next thing I want to do is read the settings inside my washing machine. Well here, again, I have wash temperature and all these different settings. Let's put this on hot. So I toggle here and you can't see it probably, but the little green light went to hot. And then over here I have soil type and I'll say heavy. So it's hot and heavy. Now I take this hot and heavy washing machine and it's ready to go. I tap this and when I tap, you'll see it goes into a remote state. Now that's kind of cool. With limited extra cost, I have just extended my user interface here. Tremendously, actually, because now I have a very rich user interface. Instead of just saying hot, which is 140 degrees, I want it to be 109 degrees. And I want my load to be in between small and, and medium. I didn't want it small and I didn't want it medium. And I want my soil type to be light and my spin settings to be extended. Go to another screen and I say perhaps I want this to be bedding so it does its thing for bedding. And then maybe this is by a kid's room and I don't want to wake him up. So I turn off the speaker on that and I put that on off. I put child protection on so the, the lid doesn't turn on. The cat, cat can't be put back in the washing machine. And then I do a delayed start. We got up to the point where we left off before and I have error code, error code three. What's error code three and where's your manual for your washing machine? Heaven knows, right? So this is error code three and we don't know what it is. So instead of calling service, if I come over here and I tap, uh, okay, I tap and it says error code three says that there is a foreign object located in the gasket. Guess what? It's the cat. We forgot the child's uh, protection and the kid put the cat in the washing machine. So now we got to figure out how to pull out the cat. So I now turn this on and there's a video. I don't know if you can hear it, probably not. So it's telling you how to pull the cat out of the gasket by the tail. And that's how you, you can get some interactive information to your customers on repair, service, things of that nature. You can also imagine this could be a uh, PDF of your manual in whatever language that you want. That's pretty neat. Now you can start to see how we're interacting with almost no cost. But it gets better than that. So next, we go into this menu where the washing machine is completely dead. Now what we need to do is call service. Usually what happens, right? your, your washing machine goes out, you call service, you have to give them the model number, serial number, all that garbage. They say, I'll be there tomorrow between eight and two and they get there at six. So your whole day's shot. So let's make it easier. We come over here, we tap on this dead machine and it goes to the cloud and it sees what times are available. I pick the one that meets my, meets my needs. The cloud comes back and says, okay, we'll be there between one and four tomorrow. All right, so that saves some time, hopefully. Now, when the guy comes to fix it the next day, it's again dead. He can't do anything. It's completely dead. But he goes into a service mode. So when he taps, it extracts model number, serial number, all that good stuff. But it's got repair history. So he taps on repair history and it says, hey, you replaced the gasket back in January. So that's kind of cool. And it says service diagnostics. Well, based on what I see, you've got firmware 1.0. And I think on my screen I show that here so you guys can see it in the back. You've got firmware 1.0 and um, you really should have 2.3. Typically that that's, resolves the issue. But remember, we have the low-end washing machine. So there's no Wi-Fi, there's no Bluetooth. So what do they do? They have to pull out the washing machine, take it apart, put a service diagnostics connector on it, download firmware. Well, not anymore, you got this. So what we do is we take our, our phone and we say firmware update. We're connected to the cloud. So now we come over here and watch this. I've just downloaded my new firmware. 
Now, of course, long patches of firmware would have to stay there a little while because the baud rate's not that, that fast. But that's a convenience I can live with, right? I didn't have to pull the washing machine out and take it apart. That's pretty neat. Now, I'm at firmware 2.3. The report says everything's cool. Try it now. Now, that's one example with a washing machine. Let's go to a dumber device. Let's go to a really cheap um, thermostat. And now with this thermostat, what we're going to do is uh, emulate a high-end thermostat. So here we have something with no buttons. This is like what you would expect in an office environment. They don't want you messing with the temperature. And they don't want to pay for extra buttons and features that they're not going to use anyway. So they buy this cheap thing. It's like 20 bucks. And it best tells you the set point and the, temp the temperature at present. All right, so first thing you do is you register. Come in with my phone, and when I tap, I put in my code. And my code is one, two, three, four. And I say done. Now I have an extended UI here where I can change my temperature just like on a high-end Nest. Now that's cool. I set my, my temperature schedule for the week. But now I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to make provisions here such that Let's say you have an NFC phone and you're an employee. You go to this thermostat. They let you change it maybe plus or minus two degrees. So I'll say two degrees, right? You can set the threshold, whatever. For you, we'll give you two degrees. So now I tap on this. And when I tap, I put the schedule back inside here. And I also set provisions for your phone, all right, for employees. Now, let's pretend that you come into the office and you want to change the temperature. Remember, there's no buttons here. So you go into this conference room. And when you tap, you extract the, the information about this particular device. And it says this is the East Conference Room serial number or whatever. And it says 72 degrees. Now, you want to change it to 65, but I only let you go 2 degrees. When you say 65, it goes to red. Now, I submit the request to facilities. With an SMS, they come back and say, that's good. You can go ahead and change it. So now I take this and I tap, and when I tap on this, you'll see 72 degrees goes to 65. So now I was able, via the unlocked uh, key that he gave, I was able to change that temperature here. And very similar to what we did just a moment ago, if you had to change calibrations or firmware of this guy, you wouldn't otherwise be able to do so. And here, you know, we, we could go into a service diagnostics mode and then um, download the firmware just as we did before. You pretty much saw that before, okay? The U code I squared C, and with the U code I squared C, what we have is something very similar, except for this would be typically done at longer distance. Now, in retail, one of the problems has been that you don't typically want to have all those components we showed you before a reader and an antenna and a keyboard and a computer and a display and all that good stuff and a mouse. So, one of the inhibitors has really been the infrastructure. But in retail environments, you have an iOS device much like this. So, take a reader, this is a reader and you plug it into the audio jack, and when I plug that into the audio jack, this becomes my infrastructure. I'm done. I've just set it up. Now I'm going to go to this guy, and here it's very similar to what we talked about before. It's RFID instead of NFC, though, but I have connectivity to an I squared C bus. Over here, I have a tablet. Let's pretend this tablet is actually um, in a sealed box. I'll put it back in there in a minute, but it has a metal enclosure like most of them do today, right? Metal is not exactly friendly for RF or NFC. So what we want to do is we don't want a big label on the outside and can't put a, a sticker on it anyway. So what we're going to do is use this case as my antenna. And with the U-code stuff, you can do that. I couple to it on the inside. And when I do that, this whole thing becomes my tag. So let's take this guy and let's cut fraud. So you buy this on the, on the internet. And on the internet, it costs you $75. Well, go figure. These don't go for $75. So it's a fraud. Then you go to Best Buy. You peel off the sticker. If it had a sticker, like a serial number, and you exchange it with the good one, which you bought for $700, and you return the bad one, you keep the good one. So that's fraud, right? We're going to try to cut that out. So we take this guy, and we put that in front of a kiosk. This could be done either online when you're ordering from Amazon, or it could be done as well um, at a kiosk. So I'm going to run my demo. And since I'm doing this upside down, I'm going to populate the values by um, uh, just pre-populating them instead of typing. It's hard typing upside down. So I populate and it says, here's the serial number, all this good stuff. I give it the destination of where it's going to go. I would do that as I put the first chip on 
the, on, on the PC board before I go to fabrication, that first chip turns the whole case or, or the whole circuit board into a tag. Now I can put the born on date, the serial number, all that good stuff wirelessly into my circuit board. And I can configure it. That's what I'm going to show you. That's really neat. So go to the next step. And in the next step it says, um, what would you like to do? Well, the first is I'd want to configure this. And let's say you have a device at Best Buy. And Best Buy obviously wants to reduce inventory because if I, if I have English versions, Spanish versions, Japanese versions, whatever, different languages on the shelf, more inventory means more money. So I keep one. And then let's say, for example, you're going to send this to your mom for Mother's Day. And, and this was inspired by an actual Mother's Day gift. But my mom lives in a different state. There's no way she's going to hook up to Wi-Fi. So what I did is I pulled everything out of the box on the iPad, and I reconfigured it. So when she takes it out, she's connected to Wi-Fi. Then I got to thinking, hey, I could do that with the NTAG, I mean, with the U code I squared C. That's what we're going to do. Instead of buying a card from Hallmark for $7 these days, what I did is I put that as the backdrop. So we're going to select a backdrop. But first, let's register this. So again, I'm populating the values. And it says here, I know it's hard to see, but it says it's Victor Vega, um, mom's Wi-Fi. And I put my, my mom's Wi-Fi credentials in here. So you put whatever you want. Right now, it says mom. Let's change it to password so you know I'm not, you know that I'm being uh, realistic here. So I say PWD. OK, the next thing that we're going to do is mom's going to learn not English, but uh, mom's learning Chinese. So we put Chinese in here. All I'm going to do is translate the welcome sign because the rest of it's too hard. <laughs> so here I go into the next screen, and this is going to be either Christmas. Sorry, you can't see that, can you? Christmas, um, maybe birthday, maybe Mother's Day. Let's do Mother's Day. And at the end of this, I put in my own personal message. Again, it's hard to type upside down, so I'll just say V I C T O. There's an R in there somewhere. Yeah, there. OK, so now I put my name in there and my personal message, whatever I want. Think that this could also be configurations of your products. So if you have a product and you need to configure it for a specific uh, customer, you can do that wirelessly as well. All right, the next thing I do is I come over to this guy and I pick a gift certificate. Now I can add value to it. Instead of buying a gift certificate and sending it separately, I'm going to import it inside of it. So I pick Best Buy. I'm going to be nice, give mom 100 bucks. And now I, I go ahead and accept the charges. Now again, remember, this could be at an Amazon ship fulfillment when they're putting the, uh, the shipping label on it. Or it could be at a kiosk, say, where you're doing this at uh, a Best Buy or something of that nature. So this is done. And what I do is ship this to my mom. My mom turns this on. And when she taps, she's automatically connected to Wi-Fi. But the other thing is, she's got her card. She's got her personalized message. She's got the gift certificate. When she clicks there, it's got her account. She can start downloading music. But then you go into user settings, and guess what? It's in Chinese. So it's in the language that you chose. Or those are your settings, right, for your customer configuration. I have my Wi-Fi credentials. I have my serial number, where it was purchased. So now if I come back, say somebody's trying to return something, they, they now have all the information relative to, to that return. The last thing I'll do here is I set maybe the errors. You know how you get the blue screen of death on Windows? So for example, as this is dying, maybe I have a bad screen or bad batteries or something like that. So as it's dying, it would, re it would save that information inside of, of the device. Now I'm going to turn this off. And when I turn this off, I, let's pretend that it's dead. I put this back in here. Mom says I need to return it. I don't have the receipt. You say you don't need it. So we take it back to the counter. And we say, let's read from the tag. Now, even though this is completely dead, what we're doing is extracting the user information or the serial number and the model where it was purchased and if it's under warranty. And it comes back with the error log, saying the USB is OK and the battery is not, so on and so forth. Bidirectional communication, completely dead. Now, that is um, UHF, but very, very similarly, you can do that with NFC. So what I've just shown you in these demos is, one, the fact is you can use these as conventional NFC tags. Two, you can use the field detect, which allows you to activate devices that were in otherwise deep sleep mode. Three, you can use the power harvesting to energize circuitry. And four, you have the I squared C for bidirectional communication. And some of those use cases that we uh, basically just described 
um, can be used and extended to other applications, for example, this. First, you have your, your, your remote user interface, so where you have a display, like a touchscreen display, you save 20, 25 bucks. Now that's cost, so when you sell it, it's gonna go up 3x. So you also have the ability to get rid of uh, Wi-Fi or Bluetooth if you really didn't need it, it's only for service, that makes sense. Um, the other thing is, as far as registration, we show you how you can save some money by, by virtue of using that. Also for the warranty and enhanced um, maintenance, this allows you to interact with the device, and even if it's off, as you saw in the tablet's case, you can still communicate to it, both directions. So, um, the, the feature recap is uh, bridge mode, which we didn't really talk about a lot, but you could do one of two different ways. Uh, you could access memory one of two different ways. I could send information to the double EEPROM and leave it resident in there, as I did with this tablet, or because of the firmware, where it's basically dynamic, you're just going as a buffer, you're going from one SRAM buffer to the micro, then you would use that as bridge mode. So that's how you use it as a modem, okay? So it comes in 1K byte or 2K byte, and of course if you're using SRAM, you're not limited by memory. It's a 64 byte buffer. As soon as you're filled with it, then you port it over and refill it again. So let's think about opportunities where you could uh, use this in other areas. Think about a, a coffee machine. We, there was a coffee manufacturer out there that was using our tags for the disposables. And the reason they were doing that is because, um, let's take an example. Gary buys this coffee machine for his mom. And for Christmas, and so, mom, here's a coffee machine. But back then, when these first came out, all they had was coffee. A year later, they have tea and chocolate and mochas and lattes, and his mom wants lattes. She doesn't want coffee, that's cheap stuff. So she says, Gary, this thing's not working. What does he have to do? Well, it doesn't have Wi-Fi, doesn't have an ethernet connection, you can't change the firmware, he has to go buy her another one. But with NTAG I2C, he takes the phone, he puts that next to it, that's his modem, he upgrades the firmware, that's kind of neat. So the other way that you can use this is not only is the tag going to be on the disposable and you put that in there, now it knows what it is. Is it coffee, tea, coffee, uh, latte, or chocolate? And now its processing could be different. So maybe it mixes milk instead of water, I don't know, whatever. Or the temperatures are different. So the other thing you can do is when I tap on that, maybe when Gary gave it to his mom, he bought her a 50-pack of espressos, a variety. And as she's listening, as she's um, uh, using these, she has favorites. She can rate them, you know, which one she wants, which one she doesn't want anymore. When she gets down to her last, say, two or three, it could say, I see that you're down to your last two or three. You started with 10, you're down to two or three. Would you like to order more? She clicks the button, and guess what? She, got, she has more at her doorstep the next day or two, right? So that becomes a revenue stream that wasn't there before. Lots of neat things that you can do with that. And of course, for warranty purposes, all of that, uh, comes in to play as well. So in, in summary, what we have here is basically some applications that maybe you can think of more, but here's a few. Um, automatic extraction of Bluetooth module credentials. Here's one that keeps popping up a lot. Manufacturers of devices that buy modules, Bluetooth modules, and they plug those into devices, they don't like to be burdened with having to power up their device just to extract the Bluetooth credentials. Instead, they plug their module in, and when you um, power this unit up, the micro would, would extract the micro, I mean the uh, Bluetooth credentials and load that into the NTAG I2C. So now I can just tap on the NTAG I2C and extract the information for the credential for the Bluetooth connectivity automatically. That's kind of neat. Navigation device. I'll give you one more example. So you saw how the speaker comes on when I tap. Let's say you and I are trying to hook up here and, and I, I find out that you're in town. I send you an SMS. I said, meet me at Mike's Cafe. And you're like, Mike Cafe, where's that? So he has a navigation system on his, in his car, but when was the last time you updated your maps? Okay, don't answer it, never. So what happens is a little wheel keeps going and says, Mike's Cafe, where's that, right? So what we're gonna do here is instead of you powering it on and then having to drive while you're typing in what city, what state, what address, crashing along the way, what we're gonna do is now you just tap, and when you tap, it powers it up, it sends the SMS address straight in, but now he's in his car and that Bluetooth connection is always downloading patches of, of new ad addresses or, or mapping information. So he's always up to date and he doesn't have to you know, screw around with it with his, with his hands while he's trying to, to drive. Um, we already talked about personal health care, uh, fitness equipment, electronic shelf labels where you want to change the price, for example, on a digital display in the store.
hotspot pairing, interactive white goods, the washing machine, for example, consumer electronics like the laptop or um, tablet, automotive. So take this one, for example. You go to buy a, uh, rent a car from Hertz, and you'll see that when you take the car back, they come along with this big pad, um, and, and then they tap on it, and they try to, usually they have a barcode scanner first. They scan it, then they have the pad, and they retrieve your information, and they type it all in. Then they get you out of the car, they turn on the key, and then they look at the, the mileage and the fuel, right? But if NTAG I2C was connected to the, the engine control module, all I do is come up to the outside of the car, and I tap on it, and it extracts that information, puts it in here, you walk away instead of powering up the car. So lots of neat things that you can do with it like, like that. Those are just the tip of the iceberg. Just in a real quick summary here, um, some people ask, what's the difference between a reader IC and a passive tag IC? Well, the big difference is a reader IC will always need power. So it's like Bluetooth. You, you need power for it to transmit. It's a transmitter. But the tag is not a transmitter, so you don't need power there. It needs to be powered, but it doesn't need power. I can talk to the tablet while it's sealed in the box and unpowered. So that's the big thing. The other thing is with a reader I see it's a faster throughput, whereas over here you're going to be limited by um, your, your speed. Um, the, really the big inhibitor here is the RF link, which is 106 kilobits, but um, you also have latencies within your system as well. Um, this is the U code I2C. Again, all we did is we had the I2C connected to the UHF tag. And then the other thing that we have here is the ability to talk inside the box, kind of like what I was trying to show you inside that. Of course, you have the ability to have quality management. Um, if you had any kind of recall, the good thing about U-Code is that you can read that, or UHF, you can read that from a very long distance. So if you wanted to find anybody that was out there that had a date code of, of a specific range, you could do so. With NFC, you have to tap on it, so that's, that's the close coupling that you have to live with. Um, and then, of course, you have the provisioning and the configuration, all that good stuff. So where people are looking at using this is in circuit boards. If I have a circuit board, so for example, there's an automotive company out there that was working with our U-Code I2C, and the idea was they make a, a circuit board that's exactly the same, whether it's getting sold to Ford, GM, Chrysler, whatever. But every one of these has different I's and O's, right? Different inputs and outputs. So the configuration for those customers is going to be, it's generic, but it gets customized. So what they do is when they're making the first thousand, maybe it's for GM, they write to it. Think of a cell phone. Same engine, but it's going to Sprint or Verizon or whatever. And you write to it and say, you are this. And so it reconfigures its inputs. It turns off some, some features and turns on others. Or if you pay for some extra features, it turns those on. That's really nice. So they're looking at using this inside of production to make them more efficient there as well. Then these are basically some of the use cases that I already talked about. So we talked about electronic serialization, brand protection, gray market diversion is basically just making sure they don't have fraud, fraudulent activities, uh, illicit returns, making sure that it's really yours and under warranty, um, customization, return logistics, configuration. We went through all that. Here's another one. You can actually connect the two together. So one of our customers wants the transactional um, effect so that you have a reader and you talk to the tag. And when you talk to the tag, you say, I purchased this, for example. And then it turns on the microprocessor. And the microprocessor then changes the code here. So if this is an EAS system, electronic article surveillance, and you walk out the front door, if you haven't purchased this, like it's a self-checkout, that's really popular now, then this guy is going to sound the alarm. But if you have purchased it, um, then it's going to turn the alarm off. And this is long range, so this would read from many, many feet away. So these two devices can easily talk to each other. And again, you can just use a micro that serves as the master. Um, and then uh, just very, very quickly, I'm going to show you that we do have readers as well. I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail, but we have a couple of different families of readers. And depending on what it is you're trying to do, we've got a lot of different reader chips. But um, depending on what you want to do, here's a matrix of, of what might be of interest to you. If you want to do energy harvesting or no power, then these are your two guys, the end tags that we talked about. But if you want to start being uh, compliant with NFC and have peer-to-peer -peer mode, meaning I can talk, two devices can talk to each other, Two tags can't talk to each other, you need a reader. But if I have two active devices, like two mobile phones, then these are the, the two um, target and initiator product platforms that would be of interest to you. And that would be covered by these products here. This one actually has a microprocessor inside of it. So you'll see it has an LPC 1227 inside of it. 
Um, and then just a different way of slicing it up, but um, you can see that we have, uh, depending on what it is you want, if you want NFC or if you want other protocols which are not NFC forum compliant right now, then you can do that as well for embedded. That usually has longer range, but it's not NFC compl uh, compliant. And then this is just by use case, saying that if you want to do pairing, you can do that with all of them, but you're, you're limited to the tags, for example, if you want to do, I mean to the reader, if you want to do payment. And that pretty much is my presentation. You guys have been a great crowd. Thanks for uh, participating. Any questions, let us know. All right, thanks.